Healthcare is the most dangerous thing to do. Muy peligroso, uh, especially compared to aviation, railroad, nuclear power, and um, just checking my time so I make sure. Uh, so it is very unsafe throughout the Western world to be in healthcare. There are many errors, there are many things that go wrong, and quality is not always as good as we want. And the question is, why? Um, in the United States, in the year 2000, the Institute of Medicine, which is a very prominent purveyor of information and research in the United States, gave this report, many of you know, that showed how many times we hurt patients from medical error and adverse events. Since then, multiple times we've studied this again and found that we are not getting safer. It's the same as it was in 2000. So the question is why? Why is that the case even when we have been putting so many resources into becoming safer? We have more leaders that are in charge of safety and quality and efficiency, uh, more focus on this. And what safety engineers believe, and the, the whole idea of our center and what is starting here is to bring the science of safety and the science of human factors engineering into the healthcare environment. In other domains, safety engineers believe that in healthcare we're doing it wrong because we are focused on human error and fixing human error rather than understanding human performance and using that understanding, that science, and that data to impact the way we design things so that we, we, do, we, we reduce harm. Decrease harm, not error, is the goal. Now, do I mean that we should hire bad people that make lots of mistakes in healthcare? No. It, healthcare already has doctors and nurses and other professionals who are very, very well-trained, well-prepared, and they come to work every day with the intention to do the very best job that they can. And yet, errors occur even in that setting. So what safety engineers have realized in other fields like aviation, commercial, uh, railroad, um, other complex high-risk industries like military command and control, the nuclear industry, is they've realized that well-prepared, smart, high-performing, well-intentioned uh, well professionals in the environment will still make error. So it's futile to try to tell them to stop making mistakes. Instead, we should design the system to mitigate the errors. Como se dice mitigate? Mitigar. Mitigar. See, okay. Mitigar the uh, the the errors so that we don't hurt patients or doctors and nurses and other professionals. The way we do that is with solutions that are aimed at mitigation of the error, not stopping the error. And I'll, in a minute, I'll give you some very specific examples to understand. Uh, first, I want to talk about our specialty. What is human factors engineering? Human factors engineering, which is very prominent in other high-risk industries, but has not been prominent yet in healthcare. Even in the United States, it's not yet prominent. We are pioneers in the United States because we're doing this in such a deep way. And your organization are already pioneers in this way in, in Spain and in Europe, frankly. There's no other place doing it in Europe, even as far along as this center is as early as it is. Human Factors uses scientific data about behavior and cognition, abilities and limitations of human beings, physical traits, other characteristics, to design things, artifacts, tools, machines, systems, environments, software, with the goal of productive, safe, comfortable, and effective use. So it makes our systems that have technology and humans safer, higher quality, more efficient. That's what human factors engineering done really well can do. And again, in this world, the Western world, not very many folks, not very many people, not many uh, software companies, medical device companies, or healthcare delivery organizations are doing this in a very sophisticated way. 
This is why we have a brotherhood, MedStar and all of you, because two pioneers doing this in a sophisticated way, both of which doing it within the organization that does innovation in our system. And it's worked very well. Sometimes it's good to say what something is not in order to define what it is. And human factors engineering is not about changing people. Now you can use human factors science and design to figure out who the right people are for a certain job. And you can use human factors data to determine how you need to optimize your workforce. So sometimes you can use human factors research to find that all of your doctors that work in the cardiology cath lab need to know how to do this piece better. So it can sometimes impact training. But it's not about fixing people. And the name is a terrible name. Human factors engineering was the worst choice of the name of this science because it implies that it's about the people factor as if the people are the problem. It is not about that. It's about using science to understand what people can actually do reliably. If I ask you to remember a 20-digit phone number right now, you cannot do that reliably. If I ask you to remember three numbers, you can do that reliably. So if I were designing a software system where somebody had to memorize a number for a minute, I would make sure it's in blocks of three. Very simple using data and our understanding of what we can do to design the system. So I'm going to give you a, an example. Defibrillators are life-saving, right? When somebody, somebody goes into cardiac arrest, they die. If we shock them right away, the sooner we shock them, the, the more likely it is to bring them back to life. Um, so in this example, when a, when a nurse was with a patient right at the bedside, the patient went into cardiac arrest, and then the nurse did everything right. Put the defibrillator on, said, called, called for help, started CPR, and then charged the device, and then said, clear, looked around, nobody's touching the patient. And then, by mistake, when he or she should have touched the shock button, touched the on button instead. In most brands of defibrillators, do you know what happens when you make that mistake? If you are ready to charge, the patient's dying in front of you, clinically already dead, you have a chance to resuscitate them, every second counts. What happens if you press the wrong button? What happens if you press the on button? Does anybody know? It just turns off. Just turns off. Right. And then it takes two to three minutes before you can shock again, because the machine has to start up, it has to go through the computer startup, then it has to charge again. Well, let me compare that to a very common consumer electronic device, something you can buy in any store. And we have right up here, we have one, an example of one, the common slide projector. All of you have used this. You probably, some of you used one today. What happens if you press the power button on a slide projector by accident? What, right. Yes, Nacho said, it doesn't turn off. Why doesn't it turn off? Because it asks you a question. It says, do you really want to turn me off? Why does it do that? Because the machine was designed knowing that you, the normal human being, will sometimes make that mistake. It anticipates the human error. Como se dice en español? Anticipates the human error. Antipado? Antipado? Yes, yes. It anticipates, and then in design, it avoids the problem. So the error is OK, but it mitigates the problem. Does that make sense? So, this is very simple human factors design. You learn about what a normal error will be in the normal use of a device, and then you find a way to design the device so that that error does not cause a, a problem. And so ask yourself, hopefully some of you are asking yourself, why on earth do we design slide projectors to be really safe and never turn off by accident, and we don't do that with defibrillators. Why aren't defibrillators designed with the same kind of error mitigation? The answer is because in the healthcare industry, in the United States and in Europe and many other Western countries, and I don't even know about Eastern countries, probably the same, 
Our entire approach to safety is to ask all of you, the users of the devices, to please remember to be safe and do it right next time. That's our approach to safety. That was our approach to safety last year, and it didn't work. That was our approach to safety 10 years ago, and it didn't work. That was our approach to safety 20 years ago, and it didn't work. When are we going to say, this approach to safety does not work? Instead, let's use design using scientific data about what people will do when they're using a device to design it to be safe. That's the basic, basic premise of the whole field of human factors engineering. So let's bring this to a little bit of a theory lesson about human factor science. For those of you interested, the real people in the cognitive psychology literature who are the fathers really of error science are Rasmussen, who developed the way of the different ways in which people think, and then Jim Reason, who took that how we think uh, and developed this into theories about how we make errors. And it's very important to understand that there are three major categories of errors that occur in human error, and each category has a different solution to avoid it. And the problem is in healthcare, when we see an error, we treat all errors the same. And so we think that we're fixing one type of error, we're really fixing another. And the very common problem that happens is the automation errors, I call them, what, what reason called skills-based error. The kind of human error that occurs when you're doing something that you do every day, that you're used to doing, it's a very common task. And this happens to us a lot in healthcare, because in healthcare, we do a lot of things every day. The nurse turns on the defibrillator every day to check the battery. That's one reason the, the nurse might be more inclined to make that error and press the power button, because that's what he or she does every day. They don't defibrillate a patient every day. Automation errors are the kind of errors that happen when you're doing a task you get, do every day. And I'm about to give you an example that will make you never forget what an automation error is. It slips and lapses. The reason I circled this, the reason it's so important, this is where we really tend to mismanage error, uh, error and safety in healthcare. Uh, Raj, just make sure you give me a five-minute warning. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. This, this type of error, you cannot mitigate or fix this kind of error with any of these things listed here. A policy change, putting a sign or a label, or, a, or disciplining the person who made the mistake, educating all of the people in their group. A nurse on, on the third floor, makes a mistake, then you train all the nurses on the third floor not to make that mistake. These things may make us safer for a few days or a few weeks or sometimes a few months, depending on how devastating the accident was, so how much we remember it, but it does not keep us safe over time. It's not sustainable. You need effective solutions to the type of errors and you need sustainable solutions. This is really important. These things don't work, yet these tend to be our major go-to ways to solve these kinds of errors. Um, and I'm going to give you an example. When we did the defibrillator study that I just told you about, we wrote to the manufacturers and we told them about the problem. And one of them wrote back and said, don't worry, we know about this problem and we've solved it because we put a label on our defibrillator to let people know how to use it right. So what do you think about handling that automation error or skills-based error with labeling. Well, think of this example, the door handle. When you use a door each day, you are in skills-based automation mode. You're in automation mode because you don't think about how to open a door. It's a task you've done since you were two. What you do, your brain comes up and subconsciously you're going through the steps of the task you're opening the door successfully, but not because you're thinking about each little step. So you're in automation mode. Now, what do you think you're supposed to do when you approach this door? Push or pull? And puhar? It looks like pull, right? <laughs> and in fact, from a human factors engineering standpoint, there's scientific data to demonstrate that most people will pull in the absence of other cues, especially if they're not thinking about it. Why? Because doors talk to us, as we approach the door, the door is communicating with your brain subconsciously, telling you how to use it. This door is communicating that you should pull. But look, 
There's a big push sign and puhar in front of your face, right in front of your face, saying push. But this doesn't matter. That does not change the error rate on that door. Why doesn't it change the error rate? Because signs do not fix error rates when you are in skills-based or automation mode. Mm -hmm. Now in healthcare, if this were a medical device and we had just killed a patient and we did the whole investigation, in the US we call them root cause analysis, do you call it that here? Mm -hmm. We had done the root cause analysis, the RCA team, after they blamed the nurse for pulling when they should have pulled, then they would, they would write a policy saying that when there's a push sign, you should always push, not pull. And then they would have everyone sign that they had been educated in the policy. That's what we do in the United States. Doesn't work. Then, in the US, we have a, a, a problem with liability. When we have liability problem, the next lawsuit is worse because now the lawyers that are suing us point out that we also have a policy violation in, it, in addition to everything else. So it's very ineffective. Human factor scientists helping you with design know much deeper uh, scientific data about designing these things. I'm giving you an example that you're thinking, well, we could all figure that one out. Yes, that's true. But the data is there for so many other things. But even more importantly, so many devices and policies and processes and things that we do in healthcare, we don't have data on. But good human factor scientists can do the methods to get the answer for you. And that's why when we have high-risk items like medical devices or, or high-risk procedures, that's when we want to involve them in the design. Um, now, a very simple solution to this, there are two reasons why this is a beautiful design solution if this were an error that could cause injury. Right? One, right, one is it tells you, it talks to you correctly. It tells you as you approach the door, push me, push me. And Puhar, and Puhar, it's saying it, right? You don't even have to think about what you're doing, it's saying it. But there's even a better piece of this if this were a safety critical task. It's a forcing function as well. You cannot do the wrong thing. Now, all of you know one person who could and would actually work around this and get their fingernails in there <laughs> and pull, right? There's always somebody, but for the most part, Right? We're in safety, we manage the numbers. For the most part, you've eliminated your problem. A simple design change has eliminated the problem and saved hundreds of thousands of dollars in training and discipline cost. And the cost of rehiring after you fire the people that do it wrong, after you've just told them how to do it right. So, I joke a little bit, but this is the basis here. This example demonstrates to you why good human factors work is so important in the safety critical industry. Healthcare is a safety critical industry, but unlike other safety critical industries, we haven't figured this out. Spain has, is the same place the United States is. You all can be the same place we are. We are pioneers in the United States. Our center is doing this so much better than everybody else. Europe does not have a center yet doing this really well. It's a great opportunity, and like, like us, we, you have the innovation infrastructure already set up to be able to do this well. Another example of this, two different drugs. One is high concentration heparin, the other is low, right? The one, on the, the one on the right is low, the one on the left is high. The one on the right you give into the vein all the time, day in and day out, repeatedly. The one on the left, if you give it into the vein, you kill the patient. Can you imagine that we make these in the same looking things? Now what's the solution to this? It's not training, it's not mindfulness, it's not the five rights. What do you, I have that on here in a minute. That doesn't help because remember it's a skills-based error. So thinking about it or saying to people they should think about it does not decrease the error rate. After we killed a lot of people, even in the United States, the actor Dennis Quaid then had this happen to his kids. We had an incident in, in Indiana where it happened to five kids. Three of them were killed. Um, then finally the company made this, which a beautiful design solution to differentiate, but they charged a lot more money for it, so people didn't buy it. Um, when I was walking through your hospital yesterday, I was in the pediatric emergency department, and on the drug cabinet is this alert that came from Madrid, telling you, caution, these two vials look the same, epinephrine and atropine. They look the same, we've had accidents around Spain, we're giving you this alert, 
What's the solution? It's wrong. It's the wrong solution, just like in the United States. This is just like something that would come out in the United States. People love to give us the wrong solution. The five rights do not work. Double checking it does not work. If I told you to double check every door you walk through for the rest of your life, do you think you're going you're gonna to use them right more often? No. Um, so opportunity in Spain, you can help Madrid see there's better ways to do this from a design standpoint. Oh, here, I made it big so you could all read it. I'll read it. OK. Um, so every time you deal with a safety, quality, or efficiency problem, and you're thinking about how to change the process or the technology or how you do things, then um, you should be think, asking yourself, will this make us safer tomorrow? Remember, there's often a gap between the way we think things are done and the way things are actually done. This gap between work as imagined and work as performed is what human, good human factors engineering will narrow. That's the skill. Um, and so, I have, do we have two more minutes for the story or are we done? I want to give, give a really good story. Um, the, actually, I'll read it first, first. It's not just about optimizing the design of technologies, but off, also about how to optimize the use of this technology in the actual context. So this, is, this is one of the problems, is often we're designing things, and we get all the leaders in a conference room, or if we're designing medical devices, we make sure to invite a doctor or a nurse so we'll have clinical context, right? That's not how we get actual clinical context. The way to get context is to actually get out in the environment be, when you're designing a process or something and see how things actually work. Remember this gap? This is the wh why we get great technologies and we implement them and we can't figure out why people don't use them. It's because we don't understand their needs. We don't understand how things can help them in the environment. So I'll leave that. Somebody's taking a picture. I'll leave it up for a minute. It's my favorite slide. So, what I want to do, I've kind of given you the background and the philosophy of, of how human factors can really impact us. I ended on this idea of getting into the environment and understanding the context of use. So to do that, um, I want to bring up Lourdes Escobar, who I know you all know, and she's going to tell you about when the light bulb went on for her. She thought, what is this dumb human factors thing I keep hearing about? They just want to like tweak the design on, on a device. Then she went and figured out, she saw this one example, and, and it helped her understand the value of it all. So, Lourdes, if you could come in and tell the story briefly. In 2014, I started to be part of the team of the factor human. And the truth, and I have to confess, Nacho Gallo, que yo me puse muy contenta porque me ibais a dar un viaje gratis a Canadá, no por otra cosa. Pero, aparte de eso, yo no entendía lo que era el factor humano, no llegué a entenderlo. Y, y además discutimos mucho diferentes puntos de vista, hasta que fuimos un día a visitar un hospital oncológico y nos eh, enseñaron un ejemplo que habían hecho. Entonces, en este hospital oncológico, habían solicitado que fuese el equipo de Toronto, the Global eHealth Team, y querían que valorasen eh, el uso de una bomba de infusión. Había muchas enfermeras que habían caído de baja por una tendinitis de muñeca. Entonces, fueron el equipo a valorar esto. Cuando llegaron al hospital, funcionaba todo el equipo dentro de los tratamientos oncológicos. Era un poco como el hospital de semana, el hospital médico que tenemos aquí en Valdecía Sur, donde iban los pacientes y les ponían los tratamientos. Pues se dieron cuenta que muchas cosas en los procesos de todos los eh, interactu eh, interactu eh, no me sale, todos los profesionales era, había muchos problemas. Entonces hicieron una valoración que no solo fue porque los botones de la bomba de infusión eran duras y causaban la tendinitis en las enfermeras, sino vieron que había muchos más problemas. Había problemas de las citaciones de los pacientes que tenían que volver en varias ocasiones. Había problemas en, en el circuito de farmacia. Había problemas cuando la limpiadora entraba y cambiaba las bolsas de basura que intervenían en, en los tratamientos. Entonces hicieron una valoración global de todo el sistema y cómo se trabajaba en esa unidad. Entonces entendí yo lo que eran los factores humanos y cómo lo podía aplicar a mi trabajo. Uh, so here's my final message 
is we have to develop sustainable solutions using good human factors knowledge. They also have to be effective. So they have to work, they have to address the right kind of error, and they have to be designed in the actual context of real use so that they're sustainable. Um, then the other thing is to focus on the hazards and the dangers. To make us better operationally from a quality and safety standpoint, uh, that's what we have to focus on. So um, I want to introduce Raj Ratwani, who's the our, our director of our center now, and I started the center, but then when it got bigger than me and needed a really smart scientist, Raj came in and has made it smarter, and he's growing it to the next level. So I want to introduce uh, our prime scientist and the director of our center, Raj Ratwani. Gracias, Terry. Okay, un poquito más de nuestro centro. Uh, tenemos 30 personas, y es una combinación de uh, los clínicos, uh, los human factor scientists, computer scientists, aerospace engineers, so it's, it's a multidisciplinary equipo. Uh, y um, es lo, lo mismo explanación que, que um, uh, Nacho. Uh, we focus on understanding human capabilities and designing technology, systems, processes to meet those capabilities. And very much focused on safety, quality, and then efficiency as well. Now, to talk about human factors in a little bit more detail, uh, tenemos que comprender la sistema. Y, y qué es la sistema? La sistema es las personas, los clínicos en el centro, y las interacciones con diferente, eh, diferente partes diferentes. Por ejemplo, la persona interacción con la te tecnológica, con um, la organización, organiz organización, different tasks or procesos, y the environment. Tienes que comprender todas de estas partes a, a, a mejorar uh, la perfor the performance and also the efficiency and the quality. Aquí está mi uh, foto favorito. Si mira al derecho, es la tecnológica. ¿Cuántas personas está usando la tecnológica? Nada. ¿Cuánto cuesta la tecnológica? ¿50 mil dólares? ¿Euros? ¿100 mil? Todas las personas están usando, ¿cómo se dice? Whiteboard. <laughs> y las personas, no solamente es los jóvenes, todos están usando en la, en la izquierda. ¿Por qué? Porque la, la tecnológica no tiene el diseño que ayuda a los clínicos. Necesitamos los, uh, el, 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 el uh, human factors, factores humanos, científicos, para develop la tecnológica que ayuda a los clínicos. Este problema existe en los Estados Unidos, pienso que en España, y todos los otros países. Okay? So aquí está el, el importante de, de factores humanos. So aquí están las um, partes diferentes de nuestro centro. Um, La mayoría de personas uh, focus on uh, investigación aplicado. So we have seis, eh, no, más de quince personas que focus de que investigación. Uh, la servicios y usabilidad, y Lawrence habla de, de este tópico en, en unos mi, minutos. Integración de safety. So en MedStar, si hay un hospital con un problema, uh, los factores humanos, científicos, they go to, the, to that hospital and they help improve the processes there. So it's the direct help for the hospital. And then también educación. So esta aquí, los partes diferentes. Here's a good example of the growth of human factors that we've seen from the scientific output. So if you look at the last 10 years and we search todos publicaciones, uh, I think this is from Medline, you can see in the last 10 years there's an absolute increase or explosion in the use of human factors in healthcare. So we're starting to do, like Terry was saying, we're starting to do a lot more of what we're doing in other industries, in aviation, in transportation. Those, that knowledge, those processes are now coming to healthcare. So we're finally seeing the improvements here. Now, uh, investigación aplicado, uh, hay, hay dos cosas. Uh, primero, es uh, mejorar la seguridad de los pacientes. Y aquí, it's reduced patient harm, is what Terry was talking about, increased satisfaction. Pero el segundo es mejorar el despeño de, del clínicos, reduce the amount of stress of clinicians, improve the efficiency of clinicians. And what we know is that 
If we improve the stress level of clinicians, reduce their stress, make it so they can do their work more effectively, that impacts our patients as well. That impacts the well-being of all of our clinicians. These are the two major things that we focus on when we think about applying human factors to healthcare. Now, I want to provide a couple examples of what we've done in our center and how we've made some of these improvements. So this is an example of a dosing chart. This is in our pediatrics. So this is given to parents. Many people here are clinicians, so they understand this information. Uh, if you're a parent and your child is sick, you're often very stressed. You don't understand how much medication to give, when to give the medication. Here on the left side, you can see this was the existing dosing chart. And some of the parents in the hospital said, we can't understand this dosing chart. It's complicated. On the right side, you see the new dosing chart. This is with the application of human factors principles to redesign. This dosing chart is now what's used across the MedStar health system. So you can see that it clearly separates babies from toddlers. It clearly differentiates the amount of medication, the type, tablets versus liquid. The picture is crystal clear as the differences that we can make with human factors. So this is on the patient-facing side. Now, we also look at a lot of our clinician performance. Y aquí no, no sé las palabras en español. <laughs> so on the bottom left here, one of the things that we've been focusing on is what is the physical activity, the heart rate, the physiological response, not of our patients, we know we monitor that, pero de los clínicos. So when do they feel stressed? When do our clinicians feel stressed? This device here measures their heart rate, heart rate variability, their physical uh, interactions. And when we put this on our emergency physicians, there are two times, you can see the heart rate in the top goes from 50 beats a minute, this is on our actual emergency physicians while they're practicing, goes from 50 beats a minute up to 160 beats a minute. That's on our, on, these are on physicians. There are two times when we saw the highest heart rate. The first time was when they were using the electronic health record, when they're using that technology. Altamira. ¿Cómo? Altamira. Altamira. Okay. Altamira. Cuando usa Altamira. Y el segundo es cuando habla con los pacientes. Okay? So there's a lot that we can do to make improvements here by understanding when our clinicians get stressed. The other part that we focus on, there's lots of examples, but the other part that we focus on is understanding how our clinicians are viewing information and processing the information. So in the upper right-hand corner, this is an example of our radiologists looking at a chest x-ray, searching for a pneumothorax, so searching for an air pocket in the lung. And what you can see here is this green area, this is a very difficult case, this is where the air pocket is. This trace here is the actual eye movements of the physician. So we have them wear a device so that we can see where they're looking when they look at the x-ray, and we can analyze that eye movement process. And the idea is that if we can analyze the eye movement process, we can make improvements to the way that they search for information. We can take the eye movement patterns of the experts, and we can show those to the novices, and we can help them learn faster. So this is actually from one of our residents, and you can see that their eye movement pattern, they don't search and they don't capture the pneumothorax. So this would be a missed pneumothorax. With this kind of technology, we can completely change the way our clinicians are learning we can change the way they're processing information. We've done something similar with our emergency physicians looking at, at an EKG, ECG. So this is the same eye movement technology, and this is called a heat map. So these, these areas here are where the physicians are focusing often. This is where they're spending a lot of attention looking. We can do the same processing to see what is the pattern of the experts that can process the information quickly and get the right response and what is the eye movement process of the novices. And once we know the eye movement process of the experts, we can teach that process to the novices. So these are a couple examples of how we're trying to focus on the clinician performance, trying to focus on how we can better train our clinicians and improve their overall performance and efficiency. So I want to just quickly touch on some of the primary research outcomes that we see, and then I'm going to pass it to Lawrence, and Lawrence is going to talk about the usability side and, and the usability of devices. The first is we've focused very much on um, medicaciones and high-risk medications. 
And what we're able to do by applying our science is reduce the number of errors related to high-risk high, um, medications. The second is, Terry mentioned, this root cause analysis process, which I, I think is, is there's a lot of root cause analysis event review in the, in the United States. And we've made dramatic improvements to those kinds of event review processes. Uh, we've also reduced the amount of payments that have to happen because of adverse safety events, because of poor safety events, and reduction in the number of premiums. I think this graph shows things very nicely. It's a little bit hard to interpret. On the bottom here is, is tiempo, los meses, the 2013, not 2016. And here is the um, uh, rate of adjusted patient days for patients, the amount that patients have been harmed over time. And you can see a dramatic decrease with the practice of human factors. Lots of other things happening in the system too, but this is with the Human Factor Center integrated with the safety at MedStar, a dramatic decrease in the number of safety events that we see by applying the science. So this is something that we're very proud of. It's part of human factors. It's part of lots of other people and contributions from MedStar Health. But these are the trends that we see when we, when we analyze those data. The group that I lead at MedStar is the usability services. I'm going to define what we mean by usability and differentiate it from the research that Raj talked about. I'm going to discuss very quickly about the usability in the life cycle of a product. I don't want to get into too much detail because Laura and Elena are going to be talking about the study that they did with IV pumps, which is magnificent. It's terrific work and through their description, you will understand exactly what the usability of medical devices uh, entails. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the FDA regulations. The Food and Drug Agency in the US has very strict guidelines for what they mandate medical devices do in order to sell devices in the States. So those are the three things that I'm going to concentrate on. You heard Raj talk about the life, the, 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 the environment in which we do human factors. And I'm going to concentrate on this dyad, this connection over here, concentrating on the person, concentrating on the technology. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the actual tasks that they do or the organization that they do, but you will see in the definition of usability why we need to take all of that into account. So what do we mean by usability? Usability is the extent to which the product can be used by specific users. So if you're designing a device for nurses, you had better include nurses in your, the development of your device. If you're designing it for the lab tech, you better include the lab tech in your device. Not only do you include that, but you need to understand what are they going to do with this device. It's not just a device, a generic device. It is a very specific device. It's got specific goals. And we're going to look at the, the specific context in which they use that device. So if it's a device that is used in a very noisy environment or a very dark environment, we're going to test that device in a very noisy environment and in a very dark environment. The, the things that we are going to be looking for are the, the quality components. How easy is it to learn? How efficient is it to use? How easy is it to remember the various steps that you have to use with that device? The types of errors that we make, and let's try to design them out of the system, and in the end, Let's measure the satisfaction that the user has in using that device. Most people think, when you think of usability or you think of human factors engineering or ergonomics, you've heard these terms before, people think that it means, oh, it's the size of the font that you're using or the color that you're using, the simple, simple stuff that comes out. But what we really include in human factors engineering and usability engineering is the cognitive support that we provide through good design. 
the, the type of emory, the memory aids, the kind of errors that Terry talked about, how to anticipate what kinds of errors people are going to make and try to anticipate those and design those out of the system. Here's an example of a, uh, a uh, health IT chart where people wanted to highlight a couple of very dangerous, dangerous values. Who can see what the dangerous values are? Anybody? How about that? Why did they choose yellow? Nobody can see yellow on white. Why show bad values, alerting values, in a color that you can't see? That's an example of the first type of, 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 the first type of interface design problem that you have with, interface, with um, usability. And now we're going to fast forward to see what a cognitive support system, this should be very familiar to our usability team at, uh, at Ideval and, uh, and at HVV. An infusion pump is not simply an infusion pump. You don't worry just about the way the, butters, the buttons are laid out or the size of the font, but you need to understand the context in which it occurs, the way you hang the bags, the order in which you hang the bags, the height at which you order the bags in order to facilitate the flow. That's anticipating the problem that the interface designer or the, the user is going to face when using a complex system. Again, we're not going to get into detail over here. Laura and Elena are going to be a, uh, a wealth of knowledge in that regard. If you're an engineering company and you're designing a device, there are multiple steps in the device product cycle where you can use human factors and usability. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because through the example that Laura and, and, and Elena are going to be giving you, you're going to see a lot of these stages and they're going to be talking in Spanish, so you're going to be understanding a lot more <laughs> from them than from me. I'm going to zip through these very, very fast, but to point out that in the early stage of the development, the early conceptual development, when you're first thinking about what design you want to build, you can use observations, you can talk to people, you can figure out what the use case, how they're going to use it. You understand what kind of person, the user profile, what kind of person is going to be using this device. You build up a persona, again, too much detail, we're not going to mess with that, I'm not even going to give you a chance to read it. Under analysis and requirements, this is where you really try to break down the task. You do a task analysis. You try to understand every step of the way that the person is going to use the device, and you try to anticipate where they're going to screw up, where they're going to make a mistake, and you try to anticipate what the consequence of that mistake will be. That's what we call a failure mode. The failure mode, we try to anticipate where they're going to make the mistake, what effect it, that mistake will have, and whether it's critical or not. If it's critical, we better design it out of the system. This is an example, a simple example of administering a, a, a medication. The task is to fully, you've got to fully depress the plunger. What happens if you don't? If you don't, the patient's not going to get the full dosage. Why did he not depress the plunger the full way? You'll go through the, uh, the various stages and make recommendations on how to fix that. Also in the, uh, the analysis and requirements phase, we do interviews, you can do focus groups. Again, we're going to zip through this. Uh, usability evaluation, a heuristic evaluation is, uh, is a technique and I think you're going to be talking about it. Uh, that, we, that I'm, again, not going to spend too much information on or too much time on, uh, labeling and uh, instructions for use on how to, do they really understand what the instructions are telling them how to use their device? There are many opportunities during the design and development phase to do iterative testing, testing over and over again at different phases. You don't have to wait till the very end to do testing. 
you can step in in the middle when you've got a prototype and you can do some testing early on before it gets too expensive to make changes. So you can do early stage testing, formative testing, and there are various techniques on how to do that. But this is the stage that we're going to concentrate a little bit. Summative testing is also called validation testing. This is the phase that the FDA, if you want to sell your device in the US, you have to do the, evaluate, the validation phase. You have to do it in the US if you want to sell it to the United States. You have to test it with US practitioners, US doctors, US nurses, US technicians. It has to be done in the US. There's a regulation that the, uh, that the FDA mandates that you have to do it 15 users of each user group. So if you've got a device that's going to be used both by doctors and by nurses, you have to run it on 15, you have to test it with 15 nurses and with 15 doctors. You have to do that, otherwise the FDA won't give you permission to sell that device in the US. I neglected, I forgot to mention that this applies to what the FDA calls a class 2 device or a class 3 device. That's a device that can cause harm, the harm that Terry spoke about earlier, where you can actually harm a patient or kill a patient. Any device like that has to be tested in this way. Why do I tell you, well, let me finish uh, by talking about after you've brought your device to market and you're selling it in the US, our job doesn't end over there. We need to follow up and make sure that it is working in the field as intended, that we're not making errors, that we, people are not continuing to make errors. And the FDA has a mechanism for allowing us, I don't think I have a slide, that allows us to record all the mishaps, all the errors that happen with a device, even if after it has been cleared by the FDA. The reason that I bring up, that I spend a lot of time talking about the FDA requirements, and remember, of all those different phases, A through E, the only one that you have to do for the FDA is the validation, the validation testing. All the other stages, as we move forward in our collaboration with HVV and with uh, Ideval, all if we can partner with you, if we find device companies in Spain or in Europe that want to bring their devices to market, all the early stage testing can be done here. It can be done here in Cantabria, it can be done here in Spain, it can be done in your backyard, in this terrific facility that you have built over here. All that stuff can be done. We can take care of the final one, the, the, the validation phase. We will take care of in Washington, D.C. You'll be our guests. You'll come to us. We will host you in the same way that you've hosted us over here. And in that regard, we will make our collaboration go forward.